Everything in life is very interconnected. Everything is dependent on conditions, and the things we do then in turn become conditions for other things in life, not only our own lives, but for the people around us. It's like throwing a pebble into a pond. The, the waves go out in many directions and can sometimes cover the whole pond. And this principle can be a good or a bad principle depending on what you do with it. Some people think that interconnectedness is automatically a good thing. But when you think that harmful actions are also part of the general web, and they can have repercussions that go on for a long time, that's a scary thought. And the fact that our happiness depends on the actions of other people many times people we don't know. We like to think we can trust on the conditions of our lives, but when you think about them you realize how fragile the whole enterprise is. If you're looking for help from outside. This is why in the practice we turn inward, because there is that element of the of our experience that's not dependent on outside conditions. It's that element is the choices we're making from moment to moment to moment. Those can be free. They don't have to depend on outside conditions. Otherwise, we'd be totally in a deterministic world. There'd be nothing we could do. We'd be cogs in a machine and have to just whirl around as the other cogs whirl around with no choice. But that's not the way things are. We do have choices. And it's in our choices that we turn the principle of connect interconnectedness either into a good or a bad thing, depending on how skillful or unskillful our choices are. So as we're meditating, we're trying to train this potential here, the freedom that we all have, train it to be a good potential to actualize it in a good way by working on the skillfulness of our intentions, because those are the forces that, over which we have some control, the things we intend to do, the choices we make. And if we can do them with more mindfulness, more alertness, we find that gradually we do become more and more skillful. So as you're sitting here with your breath. Try to be as mindful as possible about what you're doing. Try to keep your mindfulness as consistent as possible. That strengthens your mindfulness. As for your alertness, try to be as sensitive as you can to the breath. How does it really feel to breathe? Where do you notice the sensations that let you know that now the breath is coming in, now the breath is going out? Where do you feel them? How do they feel? Do they feel good? Do they feel okay, but not especially good? Or do they actually feel uncomfortable? If they're really uncomfortable, try different ways of breathing. Adjust the breath. You do have that freedom right here. There is this element of choice in the breath. The breath is one of the few bodily processes that can be automatic, but also can be, for, can be shaped by your choices. So work with it. Explore it. Try to become more sensitive to this aspect of your awareness. Because as you become more sensitive to the breath, you also become more sensitive to the mind. That's important because it, for us to judge the quality of our intentions, we have to be really clear about what they are, to make sure that there's nothing hiding behind them. In other words, often our, oftentimes our intentions can present a really nice face to us. But if you dig down a little bit, you find there's something else behind the face, something that's not quite so pretty, something we'd pr we prefer to hide from ourselves. And yet part of us knows what's going on. It's one of the immediate benefits of the practice as we get more and more honest with ourselves is that there's less of this internal deception. The mind plays fewer games with itself. And as a result, it can be more clear about what it's doing right now, what it's, 
what input it's putting into this interconnected system in which we live. Because the principle is the more good you put into it, the more good you experience. That also helps the people around you. In the West, we often think that you either have to work for your happiness or for the happiness of other people, but you can't do both together. Whereas the Buddhist principle is if you're really skillful, you get to do both together. The good things you do help you and help the people around you, if you're really skillful. It's not just ordinary good intentions, but it's informed good intentions, skillful good intentions. Those are the ones you want to work on. So we're developing the, those qualities, the qualities we need to make our intentions more skillful as we meditate. We take our one intention, which is to stay with the breath right now, not to let ourselves get knocked off by other thoughts, and we try to maintain that intention. And in maintaining it, we learn an awful lot about what it means to give rise to an intention, maintain the intention, check the intention, make it more and more skillful. We intentionally shape this process. Because the interconnectedness that's most important is the interconnectedness in the mind, how our perceptions and our intentions and the questions we ask ourselves, the answers we give ourselves, how we go about forming those answers. These processes are all interconnected, and they can be interconnected in a way that leads to suffering or interconnected in a way that leads to happiness, leads to freedom. It all depends on how we use those interconnected those interconnections. So whether interconnectedness is going to be a good thing or a bad thing, it's up to us. And as we meditate, we are given the tools to make those connections a good thing. So that the way our mind functions causes less and less suffering for ourselves and less suffering for the people around us. Now, as you work through the processes that ordinarily would give rise to greed or anger or delusion, and you find that you can manage the mind in a way that doesn't have to stumble into those unskillful states. You find that the people around you are subjected to less greed, anger, and delusion at the same time. The whole atmosphere surrounding you changes. And as you tune the mind into a more skillful state, you find that it tunes into other minds that are skillful. You tune into the skillful habits of the other people around you. This forms a kind of connection as well. But as you work on this, you find that the connectedness is not nearly as interesting or as important as that potential for freedom. Why is it that we do have this freedom here to make choices? Where does that come from? Or where does that lead if we pursue it? The Buddha's insight into interconnectedness was that it was a very complex process, and complex processes like this, by their very nature, have points where they cancel one another out. There was a mathematician who studied them, and he discovered what they called resonances, points where the different processes just cancel each other out, and suddenly you're outside of the system entirely. And the same goes with our experience. The Buddha found that you can manipulate causality to get beyond causality. This is where it really gets good, because when you get outside of this interconnected system, you find that your happiness doesn't have to depend on interconnectedness. It doesn't have to depend on the, the good or bad decisions of other people. It doesn't have to depend on your own good or bad decisions. Totally free, totally independent. That's where it get re gets really good. Because when you have happiness that's totally independent, then as you continue to live in the world, you find that you can give more freely of wise decisions, right decisions, skillful decisions, because you don't need 
the feedback that comes from other people. Because the sad side of all this interconnectedness is that a lot of it is feeding. Different people feed on each other. Sometimes the feeding is mutually beneficial, sometimes it's not. Some people are willing to offer, say, emotional food to other people. They're happy to do it. They're glad to do it. And other times the, the process is not so voluntary. But as long as we're living in this interconnected system, there's always going to be that element of feeding. One person depends on the other. The second person depends on the first or depends on somebody else. And like with all food chains, it's always ready to break at some point. There's that uncertainty. And no matter what's given in the food chain, there's always going to be a hope for something in return. But when you get outside of the chain, then you don't need anything from anyone, and you're happy to give whatever you've got. That kind of giving becomes really pure giving. Some people think that the idea of a totally independent source of happiness, happiness like that is selfish or running away from the real world, but it's not. How could it be selfish when you're in a position where everything you do is an act of giving? Well, exactly what is it running away from? It's running away from your old feeding habits, your old habits of dependence, which not only unstable for you, but also can be oppressive to other people in ways that you might not think. But they're, they're there. Just the fact that we have this body depends on food, clothing, shelter, medicine. Where do those things come from? And how many people are happily involved in the process that brings food to us, happily involved in the process that brings clothing, shelter, medicine to us? There may be some people who are happy to do it, but a lot of people are doing it through pain and suffering. That's why we have that reflection every evening. So that's what you're running away from. You're running away from the way just our simple existence depends on the exploitation of others. And that's not a bad thing to run away from. It's not a bad thing to abandon, especially when it puts you in a position where you can still be giving. And the way you part continue to participate until you die in this interconnected system is purely acts of giving, purely selfless, because you don't need anything from anyone else. That's where we're headed as we practice. So keep that in mind. That there is interconnectedness in the world, and it can be a good thing if you make it into a good thing. But it has its limitations. It's always conditional. People like to think of interconnectedness as light beams going from one jewel to another, and they light each other up, like Indra's net. Each jewel is reflected in the other jewels. It's a pretty image. But is that the way interconnectedness functions in the actual world? One animal feeds on another, another person feeds emotionally on somebody else. In the early Buddhist texts, when they teach causality to young novices, they start with a simple fact. All living, all life depends on feeding. So intercausal interconnectedness is not simply light beams going from one person to another. It's a process of feeding. which is not always a pretty process. So although you can make it good, you can make it relatively good and helpful, the best way to use the process is to get so skillful and to get so clear on this element of freedom that we have with each of our choices, moment by moment by moment. Explore that, and you find it opens up to something totally other where there's no need to feed. When there's no need to feed, feed you're totally free.
Imagine going into the wilderness without the need to feed. You can go forever. It's because we need to feed that we have to carry food with us, or we have to. Even worse, some people go hunting. That's really oppressive. But if you didn't have to feed, you could wander everywhere forever. No limitations. We're limited by the fact that we have to feed. And so as we practice, we learn to feed in, in a skillful way that makes the mind stronger and stronger and stronger until ultimately it reaches the point where it doesn't need to feed anymore. It's not like the body. The body always has to feed, but the mind, when it gets to, reaches a certain level of strength, opens up to something totally other, where there is no need to feed. That's the good news of the Buddhist teachings, that this interconnected world in which we live, the process of interconnectedness is something that can be mastered in such a way that you go beyond it totally. And then for the rest of your life, what you put back into the process is a pure gift.